Thanks. I want to welcome you here today to the CSE Colloquium. I'm uh, really pleased to introduce Alfred Spector. Alfred's been a close friend of those of us in computer systems at the University of Washington for probably 30 years at this point. He's had a checkered career. He was a Harvard undergrad. He was a Stanford graduate student, did a great thesis on transactional memory, interviewed here for a job, stiffed us, went to Carnegie Mellon, uh, did a startup called Transarc, which IBM acquired. So then he spent a number of years at IBM. Then he spent a few years running something called AZS Services. I've never had the nerve to ask him exactly what services he provided, but maybe one of you could ask him afterwards. <laughs> and now he's uh, a vice president at Google. And it's great to have you here today, Alfred. Thanks okay, for joining thanks, us. Sir. OK, thanks, everyone. Very glad to be with you today. Um, I have uh, the honor and sort of great pleasure of being in charge of research at Google and also some other of our initiatives, like our open source efforts and Google Health and a bunch of other things. Uh, so I have a number of things I want to get through with you today. Um, you have to realize when at least most vice presidents talk to you, you're not going to get like a proof of an algorithm. Because while I did that at one time in my life, I don't really do that anymore. So I will try to give you some perspective on our field of computer science and of Google within that field that's hopefully, hopefully at least entertaining and possibly educational. So I'll talk initially a little bit about Google and how we organize ourselves. And there are some considerable differences as to how we organize ourselves uh, in comparison to others. Um, I want to tell you about three themes that I think are happening and, in fact, accelerating in our field broadly. And I refer to them as totally transparent processing, the rule of distributed computing, and hybrid, not artificial intelligence. Um, I'll tell you about a few other research projects, um, some of the topics that I think are really interesting areas for research broadly, because it is an amazing time in computer science. This is a field that, while it's about 50 years old, has more opportunity today uh, than it ever has by a large factor, and I'll summarize. So as you know, our mission is to organize the world's information and to make it universally accessible and useful. While you may feel it's a cliche that probably all Googlers put this slide up when they give a talk, um, it's really wonderful um, because it's kind of the like ultimate opportunity for computer scientists uh, because there's so many computer science problems that are embedded within this mission. In fact, almost everything in the field uh, that we can consider is embedded within it, uh, whether it's large systems or security or privacy research or user interface design or how to fuse information aspects of artificial intelligence and more. And we've created a research organization across all of Google that is organized primarily for in situ work. And what I mean by that is we want to work in research at Google in a way that benefits from the vast user population that we have that's online, the vast amount of data that we have available of all forms. So rather than try to do something which we can't, we aren't a university, uh, but we are a company with hundreds of millions of users and huge amounts of information and processing, and that is our comparative advantage and why there may be places where we can greatly contribute to the world in research. So we do search and a lot more things, many of you know about many of them. How do we do it? Well, first, we focus on services. Um, I remember back, you know, I've always been into client, you know, client server and three-tier computing and remote procedure call. So services are, in some ways, an idea that goes back to my you know, graduate school days. In other ways, um, the implications have been really phenomenal of services-oriented computing. And they're, they're, they're more phenomenal than you can really write. The ability to develop something one time in one environment and use it broadly has a huge effect on productivity rather than having to deal with the combinatorics of software development that has to work in a variety of different systems. Um, the economies of scale, installation and operation, when you can amortize costs over hundreds of millions of users and maybe millions of computers. Um, resilience. Um, that you can get by replication across large numbers of systems and large amounts of storage. Location transparency, since everything is accessible anywhere across the cloud. Perhaps the ability to integrate better because you, so many applications are using the same common service substrate. The ability to aggregate user feedback, since things are in a sense effectively centralized, 
you can listen to the user community in software or as humans and gain a lot of value and a much easier approach towards aggregated user feedback. We'll get back to that. So how do we do this? Well, as you've all probably read about or at least thought about, effectively we've built a common distributed system at Google underpinning all of this. And some of your illustrious graduates of this university have been absolutely essential to the construction of that distributed system and it's been essential uh, to Google and widely recognized in the community as just an incredibly great piece of work. Um, so we have vast amounts of data processing in the cloud with global usage and a lot of shared services, which we gain economies of, of scale and barriers to, low barriers to product launch and the like that I referred to. A third thing we do is we do a very significant amount of empirical work at Google. Um, so what the company has been, was based on initially was the notion that by counting references to pages or uses or things like that, one could do a better job with search. Um, in fact, we try to do a better job with everything by counting essentially everything. So I've never seen an organization in virtually every respect that doesn't do more numerical measurement and then optimization based upon what we found. And you see it across everything. We create new products when we show that those products are numerically better in some way than previous products as evidenced by you know, a human evaluation, amount of usage, amount of data stored, whatever it might be. Um, we measure things and it's an extremely interesting thing. I've noticed, and Ed referred to the sort of 30 years we go back together, the field has dramatically changed in this regard. Um, computer science was partially an empirical discipline when Ed and I were in graduate school, but it was very significantly a mathematical, algorithmic, analytical discipline. It is far more of an empirical discipline today. I'm not saying it's entirely that. It still has multiple faces. We still have a mathematical core. At Google, we still prove algorithms work and we care about uh, bounds of time and space. But clearly, the amount of measurement in empiricism is huge. Now, <clears throat> another thing that we do is we don't typically think purely about the design of a new computer service. That we want to build a new service which will do X in isolation. What we want to do is see whether some problem can be solved by people and computers working together in the solution. So a search engine is, of course, imperfect. So without people, a search engine would return some irrelevant results and some bad results and whatever. It takes a person to go and look through the results, hopefully the top results, to find out the right information for the particular need. That's an example where, of a problem where it makes sense to solve the search problem using the capabilities of the individual and the system. But it goes on throughout much of Google. So I think there's a new form of design that we really try to leverage, and that is that we try to build a system where we take into account the users will use the system and teach it, the system will contribute to the users things that the users could not otherwise do, and there'll be a virtuous, cir a virtuous uh, circle of each group, the users and the system, benefiting each other. And that's something that we see more and more of. You see it in uh, the reputation systems uh, that exist on the web. You see it in, uh, in, in a variety of places like the Netflix recommendation system or Amazon. You can see it across the web. You can certainly see it in Google, and it's going to happen more and more and more uh, in this sort of holistic approach to design. Um, so that's sort of about Google. Those are, I think, among the key aspects of the company. Now, in terms of research, our mission is, I would say, quite standard for an industrial research lab to innovate, catalyze innovation, and learn that collectively help our company uh, achieve its mission. Um, the implications of this in any broadly sensible way is to operate in areas relevant to Google. I hope I've established that's mostly everything in the field today, which is great. Um, so we're pretty, pretty most of CS is applicable. We have a pretty diverse portfolio of points on the risk reward curve. Um, it's very clear to us we need a very strong relationship with the academic community. Uh, we come from the academic community. About of the third of Google's engineering team broadly are PhDs in the field. Uh, but 
we know we're just a small part of this juggernaut of computer science, and we truly want to be a part of it. And we have an increasing emphasis on publication. It's not the only thing at Google, but we're trying to do more and more in that. Of course, on publication, one thing I'd like to mention is that I think traditional notions of publication, in a way, are too narrow in computer science. Um, leading an open source effort is a form of publication. Uh, creating at least a good new standard, well, creating a new standard that has impact is a form of publication, hopefully beneficial uh, publication. Um, creating a service with commonly used APIs that people build on is also a form of publication. So I think we have to see that notions of publication probably need to be broadened in a field uh, like this today where there's so many opportunities to get intellectual property out. Uh, now, our innovation culture at Google is different than the traditional research engineering divide that exists in companies. Um, <clears throat> we believe we have to focus heavily on talent across the organization because even, even when we sort of know how, building systems that run at planetary scale uh, doing absolutely state-of-the-art computer science is incredibly challenging and keeping them running with reliability and availability and security is just an incredibly challenging job. And that's why we've hired such talented people. And we also believe we need to do research kind of across the business. So we've done research in teams that you might think of as engineering teams that have published state-of-the-art empirical and other papers in systems areas. And we've done clearly research in teams that are mostly research teams. And we've done engineering in the research teams. The research team on translation operates what I think is pretty clearly the state-of-the-art machine translation system and the largest machine translation system in the world today. They operate it as well as figure out how to do better and better translation. So we try to mix these things together. So we're not trying to be pure on either sides. And we think this reduces the barriers to getting new things out into the field because there's no separation between uh, the teams that build stuff and the teams that invent stuff. They're the same in many cases. Um, <clears throat> another reason to not separate, in my view, in the internet world, the research function, is you want researchers to have access to production systems. If you believe in this notion of all this aggregated information and this sort of building systems that rely upon users and all of their data in order to run effectively, then I believe that the researchers have to have access to all of the world's information that we have within it. And that's a, at least a comparative advantage for us. So it makes a lot of sense for us to organize in Google in this regard. Now, universities have benefits. There's absolutely no doubt in terms of you can have very long-term goals. You don't necessarily have to know what the commercial impact of things are. It's very clear you don't in many cases. Um, you have a free flow of information and maybe more time in some cases. There are clear benefits to universities. There are clear benefits to places like Google. We should utilize ours and universities should utilize theirs. Um, we've been publishing more um, gradually, so we are continuing to publish, as I said, and there are lots of good papers. So um, you'll recognize Jeff Dean, who is an illustrious graduate of this institution, and I'm sure there are more graduates uh, listed up here as well uh, from the institution. So uh, this, these are papers I, I can recognize very well because they're in systems, and they really did change the landscape of how people built multiprocessor uh, systems uh, in the 19 late 90s through 2000s. Um, and then in a lot of other areas we publish, so celebrity recognition is something we do at Google. Um, we do uh, a lot of work on the core technologies that are heavily used in speech recognition because uh, we're trying to do ever better uh, approaches to the Markov chain analysis and speech recognition. Um, how do we crawl the deep web? That's work that came out of people that were here uh, at the University of Washington, which is why I mentioned it. Um, we're looking at how we can utilize the massive amounts of search data that we have to detect interesting trends in society like flu outbreaks. And we now have able to localize this down to the city level in the most recent work that we do, which perhaps could provide more advanced notification than any other signal to get the right drugs to the right places just based on what people are searching on. And this is not with any semantic knowledge of the terms. This is just based on machine learning. Uh, um, I could go into a lot more of these things. This is a, a theoretical result in machine learning. We have a big team in that. So we do work in a lot of areas. We're trying to catalyze new approaches to systems as well. 
So we're trying to catalyze innovation in operating systems and browsers through the work in Chrome and Chrome OS. So for example, uh, better security isolation in Chrome uh, is something that we've been working on and better performance because we think browser performance is important and we'd like to see a lot of the you know, very fast startup times with very good security isolation when you use a browser effectively as the operating system on a, on a machine. Same thing with Android with the very rapid growth in the number of, and of specialized devices from cell phones to everything else. We think an open source modern operating system based uh, on some U Linux ideas with a lot of Java around it is a really good idea and it's uh, so far proving to be that way. So that's a little bit of the background. It's an extremely exciting place because there's a very diverse set of activities that we're involved in. Um, what I wanted to transition to now is how, what we're doing as an industry and as a field and why I think, at least in part, why it's so exciting. So, uh, you know, we can, we can look back at the field and see huge advances in personal computing, and in scientific computing and major breakthroughs that have come, what's going on today? So these are things that, at least from my vantage point, I think are going on that are really game-changing in the world. And you probably have some more beyond this list as well. So the first I refer to is totally transparent processing. So what I mean by this is that effectively for all devices that we could conceive of, from personal computers to phones, uh, media players and telematics and cars, set-top boxes, appliances, health devices, maybe educational devices, and many more that will undoubtedly get invented. So across all these devices, across the set of all human languages, across all the mo modes of information or the so-called modalities that exist, from text and image and audio and video graphics and the like, um, and across all the corpora that you can imagine, across every body of knowledge, we'd like to make processing effectively transparent, whether it's search or communication. So we'd like to be able to do our core processing without any dependence or any occlusions because things get in the way. So you don't want to be blocked because you don't understand the language something's published in or because it's the wrong modality and you want something in text and you've got an image. I think there should be fluidity across all of these forms and believe it or not, as a field, we're working on that, I think. Um, now, we could say that it's a grand challenge problem in the field to do voice to text. It would have been, it's considered a grand challenge, I think, to do speech recognition. It's a grand challenge to do image recognition. It's a grand challenge to do machine translation of human language. But these are all just pieces, I think, of this broader thing that's going on today that the next generation will grow up assuming from computers. So just some examples of this. So we, we today clearly go from text to text all the time, right? We do search and such things. We go from text to voice and voice to text. It's quite easy to go from text to voice. That's uh, pretty easy for computers to speak. Uh, human language, and we do increasingly well with voice to text, particularly in certain domains. For example, voice search, we do very well. Transcription of voice is less good, but getting better rapidly. Um, can we do text to video? Well, we do it all the time, right, in a YouTube search. Can you do video to video? We do video recommendations based upon sophisticated video processing to try to determine what people will like. Um, do we do image to image? Well, yes, you've seen that. You've seen it at Google. You see it on the Microsoft system when you click Find Similar under an image. So you can find similar images. So many of these things are occurring, and I think the new modalities get factored into this kind of a graph. So there's this immense fluidity, and you see it. So there's in search, you can see us doing query completion. That's an example of text to text. Voice search is very rapidly growing, um, and many, many technologies are going there, including unsupervised training, when you can kind of automatically look at the stream of queries to see which ones are meeting with clicks and train the voice recognizer based on that. So the more use there is, the better the recognition is. So it's a really interesting kind of AI system in its real sense that it's learning from the crowds. Um, transcriptions and voice, so this is clearly voice to text as well. 
Uh, Translate's been a really interesting story at Google that we're very proud of, and it's just an amazing team and what they've been able to accomplish is go from just a few languages with licensed technology that are rule-based to 41 times 40 language pairs which are translated today across Google using statistical uh, machine translation techniques. Um, it's, a, it's a very interesting place, but this is the demonstration that you can do a huge amount in the human language domain today and it's going to grow more in the future. We'll turn to some of the challenges in this because needless to say, there's a lot more work to be done. Um, it works on the web rather well. Um, it works in uh, cross-lingual search uh, effectively. I was looking to see uh, what was said about global warming um, in the Pittsburgh summit um, in the Japanese press before I gave a talk in Japan, and that's what this was. Uh, in the New York area where uh, we have so many different languages spoken in New York City, all of the mass transit pages have a little gadget on them that will translate the page into any one of 41 languages. Um, and there's a, just a huge amount of use of this. This was a, a, the World Wide Web Conference page in Spanish. You can combine these things. So you can do uh, speech to text and then text to text translation. And presumably it's a good thing if we could get our messages out in all the tongues of the world. Um, data is important in all these statistical things, so it's clear that we can continue to improve these blue scores as we keep training on more and more data. And while there are undoubtedly limits to this, we haven't hit them yet. Uh, so we're growing this and we're continuing to find ways of getting more and more data on the web. So in all likelihood, even without further breakthroughs, translation will keep getting better and better. So in image processing, many things go on in this as well. Recognition and machine learning algorithms are being applied to vision, um, doing correspondence to do increasingly clever uh, mosaics of images and um, stitching together of images, uh, geometry to do stereo and 3D and image processing to deduce you know, map data and such things from images. Lots going on in the imaging realm as well. Uh, find similar, I think, is going to be almost dominant in search as time goes on for images. Once you find the initial set of images which you perhaps suggest, list by typing, after that you're going to find things you like by navigation. And that's all going to use deep forms of image recognition that are increasingly deep over time. And this is an example of what happens when you type Paris. And it's uh, interesting how to do. Uh, we're doing work in, in sound retrieval. So how do you find sounds? This is a little bit exploratory, but uh, Dick Lyons has been working on this. So how can we do, you know, find me a seersucker or a woodpecker or something like that? So can we actually use the kinds of techniques we use with speech and image in other domains? So these are all the kinds of transformations among the modalities. Uh, we'll be doing things with maps and timelines and music. All these things will come together and we'll want this fluidity across all the information. So here's um, maps and Earth as a modality with 3D in it. So uh, this is the first concept of something I think that's going on in our field. And I think it's a very different world with computers breaking all this stuff down. And it, this is a project we're clearly involved in, both from a research and product perspective at Google, but so are you all um, in many ways. Many of these things require almost all branches of computer science to make successful. So a second thing that I think is going on in the world now is, is effectively this sort of ideal distributed computing movement. Now, in a way, um, distributed computing is a pretty old field. It's probably even older than 30 years, truth to tell. Um, I think you know, Ed certainly knew this, and, and I knew it. We were going to distribute computing. We would have said, you always are going to distribute computing in ways that are sensible for the application mix. It always makes some degree of sense. Not everything's going to be on your desktop. Not everything's going to be on a server. There's going to be the right mixture of function shipping and data sharing to allow computations to be done wherever it makes most sense. And that will change from an engineering perspective as time goes on, as networks vary and cost and performance and as processors vary and the like. Um, but we, did, we, did, we didn't really understand some aspects of this. I don't think we understood the application mix to which computers would be used. I remember going to a high performance transaction processing meeting, I don't know, about eight years ago, I think, in uh, 
Jim Gray at the time said, so what are we going to do with all this processing? We're going to be able to do, you know, one, one billion transactions per second, which means everyone's going to have to sit at a terminal and type on the whole planet and type a transaction every six seconds. Otherwise, the industry is going to be out of business, won't be able to use the processing. So even sort of a decade ago, tongue, tongue, or eight years ago, tongue-in-cheek, we didn't really know what was going to happen to all the processing. There's really some truth to that. We didn't know that we would be doing search queries with you know, image recognition in them that would be consuming ungodly amounts of processing power uh, within it. So we didn't know about the application mix, I think, at all at that time. I don't think we really understood the nature of these really global open systems that we have today, where everyone would be inserting applications and connecting them together, and there'd be no real understanding. When I did work on remote procedure call, we assumed that all the applications would, would know all of the aspects of them that were running and would be linked together uh, kind of statically before they started. That's not remotely the case today. Everything is dynamic. We probably assumed that humans were going to be initiating the transactions, as opposed to my airline pricing program querying your prices. Right. So we, we didn't understand in this issue of what systems would be doing. We certainly didn't understand we'd have agents working on our behalf that were consuming so many cycles, which is what Ed just, just, uh, just brought up. So I don't think we understood the, the implications of operations at true scale. So we, you know, we talked about, you know, what would you do with 10 machines or 30? Big distributed systems when I was a student were 20 systems together. That was a really big experiment. And, you know, now we're operating at orders of magnitude like 10 to the 6th or 10 to the 7th and things like that. That's just a vastly different set of issues in it. And we, I would say we underestimated completely the complexity of the architecture that would result in the systems that we designed. So we felt if we could conceive it, we could build it and operate it. In fact, we didn't think much about operating it. We just thought we could build it. And in fact, when you do everything with scale of replication of 10 to the 6th or 10 to the 7th, complicated things are really complicated to run, or at least they're really complex uh, to run. Um, I don't think we understood many abstractions that we would build on the fundamentals then known. So I don't think, you know, we didn't think about MapReduce and we didn't think about complicated scheduling algorithms that would schedule across a million systems. We had an idea of the building blocks. So I think we didn't really understand it. However, there's a lot of progress in the world. So many things have come together in that period of time in many domains. It's not necessary to read all these, but the idea is that we've been picking away, again, like in that last chart, we picked away at image recognition, we picked away at machine translation, speech recognition, all those things conspire to give us this totally transparent processing aspiration. I think the same thing is true here in distributed computing, is we picked away at a variety of things, and we've made huge progress towards the execution of extremely flexible distributed computing utilities based on these cloud computing architectures that you've all seen here. Um, with the proper connection to all of the endpoints, the billions and billions or maybe hundreds of billions of endpoints that will exist connecting into the cloud uh, on the network. There, there are just immense number of things that, that one can do here. Um, there's an immense amount of work, but I think it's very clear to me processing of most forms will migrate uh, in this realm. Now, I was asked a question. I was giving a talk at the... Um, a New York City information technology uh, um, meeting that we have for, uh, I guess, chief information officers in New York City. And the question came up in a debate, isn't the cloud just fundamentally risky from a security perspective? And isn't that the risk factor? And I think it would be foolish to say there isn't an enormous amount of research to be done in security. But I don't think the cloud is the risk in security. It's our desire to share information that's the risk. So it makes relatively little difference, in my judgment, whether we are sharing information in a federated network of lots of systems, all of which are communicating with each other and sending data back and forth and installing programs on each other and all that kind of stuff. There's all sorts of security risks associated with that, just as there could be in clouds. The real, the real, the real issue here that's fundamental to both is when there's a lot of sharing of information and a lot of people interacting with each other, there is the potential for security risk. If you wall everything off and prevent communication, 
then one can greatly reduce that. But that's not something we're ever going to do now. There's too much benefit from pooling the collective knowledge of mankind and our ability to, and letting people work together and mediated by these systems. Um, lots of things to do in optimization. Just as an example, um, uh, I think that there are vast opportunities for applying optimization in large fields, in large systems. Just one set of things to do in network planning, capacity planning, and then in short-term work like task scheduling and dynamic allocation of resources. And there's a lot more to do as we introduce new types of applications uh, across all of systems and, and optimization. So I think we're going to see as we get to these very big systems, major optimization opportunities. Um, another thing we can do with the cloud, I think, is create big online databases that are really easy for people to use. So something that is done by Alain Halevi, and the reason I bring it up here is he was a professor here for a number of years, is we built an online database. You can find it at Google. Um, where you can share, explore, combine data sets, discuss data, and publish the data um, with visualizations extremely easily. Sort of a natural use of cloud computing. So here's a fusion table with a lot of data. You probably um, certainly can't see it from the back, but they're country names and per capita amounts of water and the like. And you can decide how to share the table using traditional grants of access control. Um, you can um, or authorization, you can um, uh, look at individual elements of the table based on um, uh, filters that you put in place, like uh, industrial use greater than a certain amount. You can visualize intensity of things on maps. You can produce, um, you can have other tables that then can be joined together using this kind of a structure. Um, then you can produce the resultant joins that, that fuse data together. You can add comments onto things. And um, this would be a kind of example, I think, of the cloud even getting stronger to provide vast information stores for record-oriented data for people. So where this is going to go, I think, is towards arbitrarily high-volume transactions. Um, we'll have to have various partitionable processes for learning and data fusion that run on it. We'll have to have response time and bandwidth allocated much more carefully to provide really rapid response. Um, we think these things will get loud, get, get ever, ever, ever larger. Um, we think we can use just the right amount of parallelism to hit the sweet spot of capital and operating efficiency. So what I mean by that is you want to run with just the right performance systems that minimize the amount of computer equipment that you get and maximize the amount of energy efficiency that you have in these systems. Um, we'll continue to rely on traditional distributed computing techniques of data sharing and function shipping with connected and disconnected operation as seamlessly as possible. I think there'll be more auto balancing of load between client devices and cloud elements as needed, and we'll have to have more emphasis on manageability. We are continually to focus on energy performance in these systems, so this will be important. It's not a huge energy use in the United States yet, but if it continues to grow, it will be. So we have to pay attention to that. So my last comment um, in this, as this part of the talk is this notion of hybrid, not artificial intelligence. So <clears throat> I have to be careful because I've been picked on in this comment a little bit. I have nothing against artificial intelligence in the traditional mode of the world, but it sure seems a lot easier when people and computers are, when computers aren't trying to replace people, but, uh, but just help us in what we do. It seems like an easier, at problem and we're making really rapid progress today. So what I mean by this is artificial, intelli it, it, artificial intelligence, which was aimed at having computers as capable of people in very broad problem domains, was problematic. It's difficult to do all the reasoning as well as people have done. So I think it's proven more useful for computers rather to extend the capability of people, not in isolation, and focus on more specific problem domains. So, for example, aggregation of user responses has been really useful in learning um, in many, many areas of systems. So feedback and ranking and machine learning for content analysis, speech, speech et cetera. There have been many, many more examples of bottom-up successes in this space. So I, I think what's happening now broadly in the field is with so much usage of virtually every system we're going to gain feedback from the user community that can 
essentially customize systems to the needs of users, train systems, learn from them, uh, and generate all manner of things which we could not otherwise conceive of. So I saw, for example, just here today an education demo. We're trying to learn from the students, from the kids that are young kids, how they learn based on how they interact with computer games. And if we can do that in the education system, and we know there's vast disparity or differences in how people learn, we can, we can have systems automatically adjust to the need of the learner. And it's a clearly good idea. So uh, I think w with this, we're going to actually um, enable ourselves in these kinds of systems to get data from a wide variety of sources. We're going to learn over many, many features, some semantic that we learn from systems, others syntactic, and they're going to be generated in many ways. And I, would, I think we're going to have this hybrid notion um, of a combination of sources of information that are going to be brought to bear to help computers help us solve hard problems. So we're going to, we're going to be getting semantic information from people. We're going to be gleaning that. We're going to be gleaning syntactic information. From parallel corpora, we're going to be gaining data from what people like and dislike from how they relate to video games. All of that's going to fuse together in systems and teach our computer systems enormously, which will in turn help them help us. Uh, help us. All right, last part of this um, is uh, there, all these things are great, but there are many challenges to make them work. So first, we, wanna, we, want, we have actually started, we intend to continue to publish our view of key research challenges in the Google Research Blog. Uh, so if you type, I don't know, Google Research Blog to Google or your favorite search engine, I'm sure you'll get it. Uh, <clears throat> so here are some topics that we think are, are really interesting, some of which I know you're working on here because I talked to a bunch of the faculty and some students. But there's, there's really a lot to be done here. So first, um, new interfaces and applications with mass customization in every vertical. So, there are an immense number of new applications, particularly of mobile devices, I think, but it's across the board true, where we can build things we couldn't conceive of building, and they can achieve through this sort of virtual circle of feedback uh, an immense amount of mass customization uh, that happens sort of automatically. I see huge opportunities in health, um, and I refer you to Gitano Borriello's work, for example, um, in government, in entertainment, in education, there are huge opportunities that exist in this, I think. And I don't think we're going to quite recognize some of the applications in 10 years. I don't think we know what they are, but there are many of them. Um, we're going to have virtually, uh, the, we have un, virtually unlimited data storage. It's already true, and it's becoming ever more true. How do we use and manage this virtually unlimited amount of data storage? Now, search is great, but it can't be the only thing in this. There must be more to do in structured data and in better forms of search and the like. Uh, <clears throat> improved system understanding. How can we improve our low-level representation of, say, images that go beyond bag of words modeling? So the example I give often is there's a couple standing in front of the Empire State Building. Um, what is the picture about? And we would care because we probably want to advertise next to the image. So should we be renting New York City real estate? like in the, in the Empire State Building? Or is it tourism in New York? Or is the couple in love? And you know, we should be selling, I don't know, uh, uh, honeymoons. Um, that's a really tough image understanding problem to get, but possible to do. I mean, we could do it instantly as humans, we could tell. Um, how do we associate image and video labels with specific portions of the content? So for example, a somewhat simpler problem is, how do we know when we get to a certain set of snippets, what is it? that makes us think in the image that this is about a war or about uh, you know, uh, an apple or um, a dinner or something. Um, <clears throat> I've talked about this fluidity of partnership between people and computation. This is a UI set of issues I think we have to deal with. I think there'll be fun more and more fundamental methods uh, changing in science. Um, I know Ed is very involved in e-science initiatives here. Uh, I think in virtually all aspects of science, the computer will become absolutely essential due to the power of vast empirical measurement and processing of ever-increasing amounts of low-level empirical data. 
So I think we have great challenges as computer scientists to support that. I've already mentioned that I think optimization in systems is growing as a, as a, as a field. I think there's vastly more opportunity for operations research everywhere now that there's so much data available. With data available almost everywhere, with the ability to process that data and close the feedback loop to actually affect change, operations research is ever more important and other forms of optimization as well. So privacy and security are, are multidisciplinary in many cases, um, not just computer science. They involve law enforcement, and they involve, um, I think, human psychology and education and human-computer interaction. Um, there are too many issues to list here. Um, it's just an extremely interesting set of topics that societies are going to have to confront and deal with as, as the world changes. Um, in machine learning, what we see is we have vast amounts of noisy data, and we'd like lower variance results, and we'd like to explain why we get the results. So we'd like to be able to tell someone when we get a result that a certain drug may interact with a certain other drug under a certain condition, why we believe that to be true, and to not be really wrong very much of the time at all. Sometimes machine learning algorithms have very good mean results today, but they have a lot of variance. And that's really unnerving to people, even if it's rare that they have that variance. Um, we want supple sharing in systems, a fluid balancing that you can easily control among these topics. This is not so easy today. If we make decisions to change replication levels or things, it's often hard. Um, maintainability is a big issue. We shouldn't have to have PhDs in the field um, debugging really complex interactions between componentry, but everybody does uh, in this field today. And um, I, I, know, I, I know Jeff Dean has said this, we don't think by any means that we have all, all the parallel programming models that we need to deal with the immense amount of parallelism, including more vector parallelism that comes out of these GPU-like devices. We don't have the programming models to make harnessing all this effective. Uh, we think we need to rethink the database to make it easier to use and still powerful. Um, Fusion table is the beginning, but just a beginning in that. Um, we have breakthroughs we want to make on translation and speech. Um, I do believe we'll be using vastly more signal, including a lot more syntactic and semantic information as we continue to push quality uh, in that. Um, we've done really very little with multimodal interfaces. Despite a lot of work in the field, we mostly use one mode of interaction with the system at a time. But I think that may change. Um, I often talk about the fusion of our field with other fields. I've mentioned it a little bit earlier. I continue to think that's extremely important to find ways to get our field to help others and vice versa. It doesn't mean we're consultants. It means we're part of the other field, typically using our capabilities of computational thinking, computing with ultra-low power. So what would we do if our devices really had to operate with just ambient light as the power source? So that's an interesting question. So we've been used to saying, well, gee, if the machine runs at 10 million instructions per second today, it'll run at 40 million with the same power or nearly the same power in five years. But what if we really want to run something at one-tenth of the speed, or one one-hundredth? What can we do? Can we do enough? Um, I talked about this combination hypothesis of applying all manner of things to, to uh, get better understanding. The list goes on and on. But I think there's so much in the field, we should continue to have a lot of fun and make the world a better place. So at Google, we certainly did want a great um, relationship with all of folks at the University of Washington. We want to continue to build on what we have. Um, we want to collaborate with you um, for mutual benefit. Um, we have a good knowledge of challenging problems and an employee mix that's uh, really talented and opportunities for internship and sabbatical and, in some cases, money for grants and such things. Um, you have fantastic intellectual skills here and people, and they should go together in many ways over time. Uh, we have internships. We have an intern program this summer that is I don't know, 30 to 50% bigger than last year's, which is a great thing. So we're looking for interns. We have a visiting faculty program, which has worked out very well in many, many cases. And we've uh, recently introduced a graduate fellowship program in the United States. We're doing it in Europe as well. We provide research grants, some smaller, some larger, about 150 worldwide. And I would recommend if faculty and students have proposals, they're developed with the advice and perspective of Google faculty that kind of know what we're interested in. We have a collection of websites, of course, uh, to look at. So with this, I think I will basically stop. I'll leave this up.
um, and you can read it. Um, and I will take questions. So we have a few minutes to do that, it being 4.20. Go back a slide. Yeah, sure. OK, sure, absolutely. So um, I would love to take some questions from you all, if you have them. And I can hold my neck up just enough to see in the back. So what can I answer for you about research opportunities in the field, or Google, or our structure, and research, and relationship to universities? Yes, in the middle. I'll be the first to ask, I guess. Um, so with great power comes great responsibility, right? So you have access to a lot of data. You have access to a lot of current data, past data. And you can see how maybe, I mean, theoretically, in a conspiracy sense, you have uh, even the power to impact elections based on the first result that you return for a query of, query of Iraq, for example. Are there particular research challenges that you know you could pot potentially attempt but you've decided not to pursue because of a particular feeling that you should not do? Well, <clears throat> we, yes, we have a there's, a, there's a deep technical term for this. We don't want to be creepy. <laughs> Uh, no one wants a creepy computer. And, and that's a, it's, 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 it actually, of course, is not a technical term, but it's a term we all understand, I think. So it's, it's, a, it's I think, a, an area of, an, and it, it relates to the kind of privacy aspects of things, but perhaps more. Um, it's a very interesting set of questions that arise from this. So, you know, personalization is a positive sounding word, right? Getting things that are, what you want personally sounds great, but they could be creepy, right? If the system knows things that you didn't want it to know. So it's a, a very interesting set of questions on that. Uh, I've never seen any issues about, I mean, we, we apply, I think, extremely neutral algorithms to ranking and you know, crawling and such things. So I've never seen any of the concerns that you raised uh, in your question in that regard. But on the privacy set of issues, I think there are lots of challenges um, in, in helping our consumers use, have a system that is ever more sort of responsive to their needs, but that is not in any way creepy. And I, I think that's going to be, I think there's gonna, it's going to be different in different parts of the world. I think it's going to change over time. And it's going to be up to us as systems people and privacy experts to build systems that are sufficiently robust that they can support whatever the uh, desires of the population are. And, and it, it will vary by individual. I don't know if we, we recently uh, introduced a privacy dashboard at Google, for example, that actually shows people uh, what we know. And you have quite a bit of control over that. And that's a that's a good step in, in the right direction, I think. Yeah, another question. So you mentioned um, with the talk of cloud computing about security and, and whether or not, in your opinion, as long as people are sharing information, there are going to fundamentally be problems of, when you try to share information, there's security problems. And so if it's in heterogeneous distributed systems or a cloud, that issue doesn't change. And so you might as well push it in the cloud for a lot of good reasons. But in the absence of that problem, um, when you look at these distributed systems, heterogeneity provides uh, strength or diver diversity in heterogeneity provides resilience for these online systems. So if there's a single programming bug and everybody uses the same cloud system, that can expose everybody's data. But if you have diversity in the system, then um, that doesn't necessarily take down the whole system or impact everybody. So given that you want everybody to be using Google's cloud, do you consider developing diverse and heterogeneous competing cloud systems internally to share amongst your users? Uh, so I think it's a very good point, right? So people have thought about n-way programming for a long time, for example, in order to minimize the chance that a single programming error can take down a whole system. So the space shuttle had two separately programmed or has two separately programmed onboard systems. Um, I'm not sure they ever had to switch over to the second one in a flight. Uh, I'm not aware of it they ever did. Um, but, but it was done for that reason. So I think it's a good point. So I think as you build resilient systems, you want to make sure there's some diversity in the implementation of the system. Uh, and I think that it probably happens naturally because one runs somewhat, you know, even within a cloud, you tend to have multiple versions of software running because you can't upgrade everything atomically. So you end up with version N, version N plus one, maybe version N minus one running in systems. 
Um, so there's some diversity that occurs because of that. Um, it probably makes sense, though, as you suggest, to actually have it be a very considered approach towards availability in systems. So I, I think it's a good observation. Other questions? Uh, yes. So, so I'm interested in this sort of hybrid model that Google now has with research and people doing very advanced things in the development organization. Right? I used to think of Microsoft having development and research, and that has a, a set of plus points and a set of minus points. And Google having lots of PhDs in the development organization doing really forefront work and publishing it when it wasn't the corporate jewels. And again, lots of positives and some negatives. You're now in some sense doing both. And I wonder if you worry about tech transfer from the research organization to the product well, organization so, or not. Okay, so the, it's, a, it's also a fine question. So I think it's worth um, saying that more or less within Google um, that the company has research spread across it, as, as it always has. Uh, it does turn out that there is an organization called research. However, for the most part, that's the topical, it just describes the topical areas that that group focuses on which happen to be translation, speech, um, machine learning, natural language processing, and a few more um, that for one reason or another just aggregated within that team, partially because they had pretty researchy backgrounds. But they've all become product oriented as time goes on. So uh, in effect, there's not as big a difference. I mean, we run a lot of production systems out of the research team. So we've tended to keep this boundary blurred across Google even as the research team has gotten built up. And I think we'll continue to do that. So the risks in, in an organization like ours, I think, stem from will the organization be short, too short-term focused? So the traditional idea of a Bell Labs, for example, was if you have a research team that is not related to the development teams, they'll look very far into the future without regard to commercial importance. And if the teams are related to development teams, they may become too focused on, if you will, near-term hill climbing. So what I think there, there are two things to consider as to whether that is likely at Google. Um, the first is that this field has, to a very large extent, been evolutionary um, in, in its base. So one programming language has followed another in evolutionary ways forward. So there's been an enormous amount of evolution. So very rapid evolution has been perhaps the most successful thing in the field, very rapid evolution. Uh, the second thing is that the company is highly technical in its leadership. And the leadership is extremely demanding of aggressive innovation. So as long as that is also true, that will tend to put a lot of um, challenge for people to really do, do as much breakthrough as they can. So other, other thoughts? Yes, sir. Uh, I haven't looked at all of Google's applications lately, so I don't know whether I'm being redundant. But do you have something the equivalent of save my searches for me individually, um, let me exclude a search from the organ from the thing, and then have your uh, thing where you take that series of searches of mine and try to give me a better search thing, and where you save the searches so that if I've seen a site before and it hasn't changed, then I can exclude it from seeing it being seen so that I don't have to keep repeating the same searches and vetting the same searches. So actually, I'm not sure that we've handled that case or not. I know we've handled the case that we will show you search results that you have seen before. Because that's, believe it or not, also a common case. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, you can say, look, I know I've seen that before. Show me, show me the website that showed me such and such. And you want to go back to what you saw without remembering how you got it and exactly what you got it. You talked about the quantitative approach to, to the research. Do you feel you missed some things by the aggressive attention to quantitative, or is it uh, catching almost everything you want? Well, the, the big risk, I think I almost alluded to it a little bit earlier, is will you achieve a local optimum that somehow misses a global optimum that's only achieved by going through some valley? So uh, I think overall, it's really valuable in our field, as I said, because the field has been primarily an evolutionary field. 
However, I think one has to pay attention to that risk. So it does take, there has to be people that say, wait a second, we know we're going to be 3% worse on this, but that's going to give us a chance to apply a whole new set of features in the learning, and that's going to get us 6% later. And that's going to be a far better approach to enhancing things. So you can't be strictly by the, you can't be strictly by the numbers, but having the numbers there to guide you on this and to, and to sort of frame the problem, I think, is really important. One more question, or are we done? Uh, yes. So you mentioned that a lot of your, your research has gotten more and more product-oriented. Do you have any research going on which really just isn't product-oriented at all? So I, I didn't, I, what I said is we do a lot of products in the team because the projects have been successful. So I don't think it's become in, uh, more product-oriented because we've just decided to not do research. It's just that either fortunately, or perhaps if you have a, a sort of weird perspective, unfortunately, the, the research has been successful. I think it's fortunate. Uh, so that's why we end up doing more production systems in the team. And it just, we think it just makes sense to keep everything together so that everyone uh, you know, sort of knows all aspects of the problem. So uh, we do do things that are further out. So, um, but, but we do things that we think will have impact. So for example, we're doing some very long-term work in, um, in understanding vision and understanding from that understanding of vision what will be new features that should be used in vision systems for doing feature recognition and, and image understanding. So that's just, it's one example, but there are many. So there's a lot of stuff we're doing that's much longer term that might or not, might not pan out, but that if it does, we think it will move the needle quite a bit. Okay. Great. Let's thank Alfred. Thank you very much. Questions, come on down. <laughs>